All right, good morning. good morning. So I'm going to pick up a little bit of where I left off last week because so many people said to me, what happened to Jacob? <laughs> so what happens? What happens? So, uh, so I can finish that story for you. Uh, Jacob is received by his brother Esau with nothing but affection. Jacob goes on and has many children with uh, Leah, the first wife, Rachel, the second, and their maids. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Hey, I'm just the messenger. What can I say? Uh, and with his beloved Rachel, he uh, has a son, Joseph, who will go on to have a Broadway show uh, that is uh, about his Technicolor dream coat and all that. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, conflict, uh, even tragedy in his story. And so reading the story, you might actually feel uh, that he's, he's kind of deceitful and actually deserves to be forsaken. But I think he's like us, like so many people, doing the best he can do with the tools he has in any given situation at any given moment. You know, he's doing what he needs to do because that's what he believes will meet his needs, right? And so if we look at our own lives, you say, well, gee, we probably all do very, very similar, not the same things Jacob did, obviously, but we do what we know to do to try and accomplish what, what we're after. Um, see, but Jacob, Jacob's learning. He's growing in consciousness like we are. And he has obstructions. He has challenges. He has joys, just like all of us on the journey. So that pretty much wraps up Jacob, except for the fact that we're like him. Uh, and so today, I was going to sort of move this over into talking about uh, choosing illumination. So illumination in the Western world is what enlightenment is, or very similar, in the Eastern traditions. But um, I, uh, I want to share with you that, you know, uh, Jack Kornfield is a great meditation teacher here in America. And uh, I've, list I I've never taken a class with him or met him in person or anything like that. But I think of him as one of my teachers because I was listening to um, Okay, so far back, I was listening to cassettes of his 40 years ago and uh, as he was teaching me how to meditate. Anyway, he tells a story that I think is actually um, relevant to this idea of illumination. And it actually takes place, he says, in an African tribe. And there was a particular tribe in Africa where when a couple become pregnant and they know the woman is now going to conceive at some point, uh, people in the village gather around and they, they do this practice that they start to s create a song that will be the song for this child when this child is born. Now, the child's not here yet, but intuitively they create this song that is essentially, uh, and th these are my words, not Jack's, that is essentially recognizing uh, the illumined presence within this being that is about to be born. And so then when the mother goes into labor, the people in the village gather and they sing this child's song as a welcome of this child coming into earth, uh, coming, coming on, onto the earth. And then throughout that child's life, when that child might be sick, the people gather around and sing this child's song so that the child will remember a, what we would say in Science of Mind is a greater truth about themselves. And then on and on through life, when that child uh, gets married, they sing that song. And when that child is having children, they sing that song. And when years later that child is old and is going to die, people gather around and they keep singing this individual's own unique song that was created for them. Now, I know not all of us here can write a song or want to write a song. So my invitation to us today is I want you to think about what's your song? What's the song that you would sing that reminds you of the greatest truth within yourself? Or it might be the song that makes you feel the most empowered. I did a memorial service a couple weeks ago, and um, someone in the family got up, and uh, when it came time to share about the individual, what they did was they shared the lyrics of Frank Sinatra's My Way, all verses, all verses. They did them all. They did them all. It went, it went on and on and on. But you know, in hearing it, when you think about it, it's like, well, that, I could really see that that was this, this guy's song. That was like his. Now, he didn't say it was his song, but it was certainly an appropriate song for you. So some of you are thinking, oh, what's my song? What's my song? Well, you'll have plenty of time. And you can change your mind if you pick something and then decide you don't like it. It's OK. All right? um, 
But I like the idea that there is a song that we come back to again and again. It might be a song we sing here at church that reminds you of who you truly are, that empowers you, that helps you get through whatever it is you're going through at any given time because it keeps us, I believe, tethered to a greater spiritual truth. And I think, and what, an, what an incredible tradition. What if we did that with every child that was born, that we created a song for them, to always remind them that they are special, that they are unique, that they are beloved in God and also with us. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what your song is, I'm sure it's going to come to you before the service is over or you will tell me next Sunday when you come to church. Let me give you a hint of what it's not, okay? <laughs> it is not, I can't live if living is without you. That is not the song. <laughs> Okay, and things along those lines, okay, those are not the songs that are going to empower and uplift and fill your spirit and carry you through difficult things. I don't know what your song is. I don't know, but you're probably already, already thinking about that. Um, it's important for us to remember as students of science of mind that there is as much God, as much spirit, as much truth, as much love and consciousness in each of us as there is in anyone, including all of the great beings who have existed on the face of the earth. You know, so we could ask, well, you know, how do, how do we choose to live? And, and I think a better question, right, to ask would be, because we're students of the science of mind, how do we choose to think? Because Ernest said to learn how to think is to learn how to live, right? So when your thinking is correct, your life will unfold in a greater, more harmonious way, all right? So when I ask this, you know, how will I think? I, what I'm asking myself is, will love come first in my mind? Uh, will my life be filled with good or will my life be filled with fear? Um, will the good that's present disappear or will spirit bring new good into my life? See, I believe we're looking in the wrong place for good, and the wrong place is outside of ourselves. In the science of mind, we teach that we have to put our faith and trust in the eternal presence of spirit that, yes, it's everywhere, but it's also within us. Mm -hmm. um, because if we put our, our faith, our trust in something outside of us, whether it be a person or a situation, or a job, or I don't know, a bank account, or something like that, then we're creating a false god. And one of the instructions that God gave to Moses was, have no false gods before me. Right? So it seems to me, if, if God is, 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 is out here, then there's only so much that, uh, that we can do to be in relationship with something that's separate and apart from, house, uh, apart from us. You know? and, and it seems to me that... Um, what we're always doing, if God is out here, if the source is outside of us, then we're always divvying up the pie. You know, because the belief generally is that there's finite pie in the world. Uh, uh, and as you would imagine, I'm sure, you can, it's not a stretch that I love pie. Um, <laughs> Uh, blueberry, lemon meringue, pecan. Okay, there you have it. That's, that's like the complete menu as far as I'm concerned. But, but if the truth be told, I probably never met a pie I didn't like. Um, now, uh, my favorite, favorite pie, though, that being said, is infinite pie. See, I believe God has infinite pie, pie being whatever we need. If you need health, God has infinite pie. If you need... Uh, more financial resources, God has infinite pie. If you need a loving relationship, God has infinite pie, pie being whatever you have need of. So I think um, when we don't, uh, if we're looking in the wrong place, that false God, that idea of something outside of me is going to complete me, something outside of me is going to heal me, something outside of me is going to make me okay or enough, I'm, that's, that's just going to lead to heartache again and again. Now, in the science of mind, we teach that what really endures is beyond the visible. And it's hard to know with the senses, yet in science of mind, we teach that that is actually more real. The spiritual part, the unseen part, is more real than the visible. You know, we can't be separate from it because it's an integral part of our being. I think at some time in our life, you know, we've probably all gotten to the point where we ask or say the statement, God, there's got to be more than this, right? It's that Peggy Lee song. Now, I think this is just one of those fascinating uh, synchronicities of the universe that Peggy Lee was also a religious science practitioner. 
And the song that Peggy Lee, one of the songs that she was most famous for was, Is That All There Is? You know, which I think if you were on a spiritual journey, at some point in your life, you were going to ask, is this all there is? Isn't there something more? Isn't there a something greater to which we should be aspiring to be in greater relationship and greater connection with? Yes, there is, there is something more. Um, I, I think we ask, uh, I think the kind of questions we ask now on a Sunday morning when we're awake and we've maybe had our coffee or tea are different than the questions we ask at 3 in the morning. You know, when you can't sleep and something is chewing on you, you know, it's just where your mind is going and going and going. Um, uh, because it seems to me at 3 a.m., our attention tends to be focused on something outside of ourself rather than the principle, the power, and the presence of spirit that's within us, you know? And, and the sun comes up, and what happens is, well, we just join back in the rat race. But like Lily Tomlin said in Search for Signs of uh, Intelligent Life in the Universe, the problem with winning the rat race is you're still a rat, <laughs> right? And so that may be you know, something that we want to shift a little bit there. I think as spiritual students, we want to live effectively in the world and simultaneously develop our expanding spiritual consciousness uh, uh, to... Uh, So I think this idea of choosing illumination, it takes perseverance. You know, we're going to need courage to practice what we believe in the face of obstacles. Now, people have said to me, say, well, you know, if I'm really practicing the science of mind, shouldn't there be no obstacles? Now, Ernest says in what I believe, or what we believe, our, which is a, a, a statement he made of our principles, is that we, he said, we believe in the emancipation of all discord. Oh my gosh, is that going to happen in our lifetime? Will we actually be free from every kind of discord? I don't know. I don't know anybody who has reached that, but I think it's a worthwhile goal. I think it's something that we move toward, and I think it's a process. It's not a destination. You know, so choosing illumination, it's going to take some perseverance on our part. Um, when we begin to add light uh, to our life, it's like adding light to a dark room. You know, the darkness doesn't argue with the light. The darkness just disappears, you know? So um, now, if it's a room you haven't been in for a while, you know, your mind may say, well, this is going to be hard to bring the light here, you know, because this room's been closed up for a long time. And, and you know, since the 1994 earthquake, you know, you haven't opened the door to that room. Things have fallen off the walls and blah, blah, blah. Um, that may be uh, uh, how we're looking at it. But, for, uh, but the thing that's always amazing to me is that when you begin, when I begin to add light to a situation, the darkness doesn't argue with the light. You know, the, the darkness just receives the light and ceases to exist. So for us, we see it uh, as a way to start, I think, clearing things out. You know, we, we, um, we clean out our mind of things that have been in there perhaps for a long time, old beliefs, beliefs that keep us small, beliefs that keep us lacking. Uh, or keep us limited, beliefs that keep us sick, or beliefs that keep us lonely. Um, you know, I think about cleaning out my mind, and I think, God, I'd rather clean the garage than clean my mind. And I hate to clean the garage, I really do. Because, but, you know, cleaning the garage is actually easier than cleaning my mind. You know, so just notice, if you're becoming aware of, of, of a belief that actually clutters your mind, that no longer serves you. And you know, it may have been, because we're all evolving, it may have been that those beliefs helped keep you safe at an earlier time, or they served you in some way at an earlier time. You might be aware of it, and uh, uh, that you have a belief, and what you've done is what many of us have done, is we learn to operate over it. You know, it's like, oh, I'm just going to suppress that for now. I'm not going to think about that now. I have other more important things. Uh, I might want that later. You know, I might, I might need that belief down the road. I'm not ready to completely let it go out of my life yet. You know, and it's just, you know how beliefs are. Some of them are just so comfortable and so familiar. Even if they do not make our life better, we just know those beliefs so, so well. It's like, it's like trying to get stuff together for a yard sale. You know, if you've ever had a yard sale? Um, 
I'm going to let go of this. No, I think I better keep it. And then you put it in the box, and then you take it out of the box. And you carry it out onto the lawn, and then you bring it back into the garage. You know, and again and again, it's that process. It's, it's, it's not always as easy to let things go as we would like it to be. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. I think it must be a belief, really a deep-seated belief in lack. That if I let this go, what will fill it up? What will fill up that place? Well, I think this is, this is really where our, our practice is leading us to a knowing that the universe does hate a vacuum and that if we let something go, God will bring something better into our life. You know, if we're so resistant to let go of that old stuff, then I think about, wow, how restricted I am by not letting go of the thinking that doesn't serve me anymore. Um, I think this is connected to why people resist a spiritualized life. They think that God's going to take all their good. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I thought about doing that spiritual thing, but, you know, I think God, God, God does not want your good. God is the good, okay? So God wants all the fear and the craziness around your good. That's what God would like to take from you, not the good. The nature of God is to give of God's abundant self. So, you know, there's no spiritual foundation in that kind of thinking, that, you know, God's going to take my good from me. That people, people have an old notion, you know, people have that Old Testament notion of God. God is much greater, much nearer, and much more loving, I believe. And so that means that we, individually, that we are much greater and more powerful and more deserving. Because good of every kind is God's nature, right? And that means that good of every kind is what we are made of, and good of every kind is what we are intended for. So there's always a way for God to give and for us to receive every kind of good, right? That way is through a consciousness that has learned to think correctly. This is what the science of mind teaches us. This is why we talk about our thinking all the time. It's so important because to the mind that's learned how to think correctly, it's easy for a spirit to rush in and increase our experience of life. Anyone can develop that consciousness. Ernest Holmes teaches us that God is both love and God is law. Love is a presence that we court, and the way we do that is that we court the presence when we meditate, and God is a law that we learn to work with intelligently, and how we work with it intelligently is by doing spiritual mind treatment, praying in an affirmative way. So when I say I choose illumination, I think what's available in that is that life has great good for all of us. Do you want the greatest good that life has for you? Well, of course you do. And if you do, and I suspect probably everybody here does, that's why we're here today, as we clean out our mind, there are three things I want us to consciously put in. And the first one is that there's one God, one power, one presence. All right? That's fundamental to the science of mind. There's only one, it's God. The second thing that has to be there is that one God, that one God loves us all. You are valuable right now, as you are right now. God doesn't love you because of what you do or what you have or any of that. You are because God loves you. That's why you even exist, is because you are an expression, an emanation of the very love of God. And God is a universal spirit that must create through us according to our thought. This is science of mind. The way God creates, the way our life gets better, the way our life gets healed, the way we become more creatively expressed, the way we have love in our life is through the right use of our thought. This is what Ernest Holmes refers to when he says there's a power for good in the universe and you can use it. We're supposed to use the power, the power for good, to evolve our life, to heal our life, to grow. Right? It, it, it takes nothing away from God for you to use it. Hmm? So have you ever been um, in a boat and the water was rough? Uh, I remember uh, seeing that movie a, a long time ago, The Perfect Storm, uh, which made me never want to go in a boat again. Uh, but, uh, but what I believe is true is that if you go into the water and you go down deep enough into the ocean, there would not be the turbulence that there is up on the surface. Right? As you go deeper and deeper, all that there would be is sort of a little rhythmic moving. Right? So it's much more peaceful down deep than it is up on the surface. 
oh my God, this is just like life. This is the spiritual life. It's much more peaceful when we go to a deep place, when we turn our attention inward, when we close our eyes and meditate, when we pray, when we do our spiritual study, than it is when we're out in the middle of all the effects that are happening in the world that we live in. You know, we don't, we don't want to live in that turbulence, and yet so much of us have spent so much time in that kind of turbulence. What if, what if we live our life out from a place of greater consciousness, from a place of illumination. And see, when I say from a place of illumination, what I'm saying is a place where we let the spiritual truth that's everywhere but within us, we let that guide us. We let that fill our minds. We let that be in the words that we speak out into the world. You know, as Jacob said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I just don't know it. I think that's true for all of us. Let's remember it. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, just becoming still and knowing, affirming, and reminding ourselves that God is right where we are, that we are surrounded and filled with an infinite loving presence, a power of intelligence and creativity and abundance and joy. And this is the most true, most real thing about each and every one of us. We are emanations of the Most High God. And so in this awareness of our connection with God and also with each other, I speak the word for each and every one of us. I speak the word that, like Jacob, we are evolving in consciousness. We are so much more than we have ever been, and yet we're not all that we are in the process of becoming. So I know there is a greater good in store for each and every one of us, and that good includes everything that would add to our life in a healthy way. So whether it's a loving relationship or a healed body or enough finances to do what we need to do, a perfect creative project, on and on and on, I know that it is absolutely within our grasp to have those desires revealed and fulfilled in a loving way. And so I claim that is the truth for each and every one of us today. And in, in particular, any area where we feel really stuck, where the thought forms are, are fearful to us, uh, their thoughts of separation or doubt or not enough. We choose illumination in that area. We choose to think God's thoughts. Because like Einstein said, I want to think God's thoughts, all the rest are details. And so we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of those we love and hold near and dear. We see them in our mind's eye and we surround them with love. We claim illumination for them as well that wherever they're stuck, wherever they need help, we know that the light of the living spirit fills their being and illumines their mind, revealing exactly what is right for them. So we let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, so all that looks fearful to us, all that's doubting, we say God is right there, as peace, as healing, as all needs met. Because the God that we believe in is so much greater than even the most extraordinary big circumstances. We bless our church. We bless all churches. Synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together. That there is raising up, that there is healing for each and every one of us. And we say yes to it. So with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen.